Information presented on Sky News Real Estate is general in nature. Viewers should seek their own professional advice before purchasing products or services. Sky News Real Estate may receive a fee for commercial arrangements with companies featured in this programming. Real Estate. Smart Investing. Hello and welcome to Smart Investing. I'm James Treble. On tonight's show, you can hit the gym if you want to build some muscle, but how do you go about strengthening your personal finances? And you can go to the doctor to get a checkup on your health, but who do you go to to monitor your wealth? And what can you do to optimise your tax return? Well, joining us tonight is Stuart Waugh, Director of Bell Partners Accountants and favourite of the show, Charles Tarby, Chairman and Owner of Century 21 Australasia. Now, Stuart, when it comes to personal finances, um, what are some of the areas that you consider to uh, make your, your stance stronger? I suppose, you know, the, we can always be stronger and we can always monitor our strength by saying that we should run our life like a business as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're looking at a, a business, the first place you start as far as um, where the business is at, as far as outgoings monthly, in, incoming monthly, is to look at, to look at bank statements. Looking at your bank statements for a month, looking at your bank statements for three months, looking at your bank statements for a year, that kind of tells you um, where, how far you're going behind each month if, and, and how far you're going in front each month. That means you can basically say, right, well, there's a kitty of money of which I need in there every month in order to meet my outgoings. And that's a, that's a way of saying, you know, right, how strong am I as far as cash flows every month? Then I would you know, go a bit further and say, right, well, the tax return. The tax return is an obvious choice as far as knowing where you, what your family financial, financial strength is and saying, right, well, this is what I'm earning every year and therefore you work backwards from there because obviously your tax return will show you what your net position is as far as your money coming in. So for example, $180,000 worth of income, $56,000 for the tax, leaves you with about $124,000. That's roughly around about, you know, two, two, two and a half thousand dollars a, a week. That's basically you've got as far as money to spend. That's kind of where you should be as far as knowing where your outgoings are and income is going. The other thing, there's obviously super. Every, every employee's got super. So those kind of instruments as far as knowing where your mortgage is, the property you bought, where that was, where that was bought when you bought it and where it's gone since then, and finding out where your outgoings are going every month. That's kind of where the documentation sits. Yeah, it's not, sits. not so much about how much you're earning, it's about how much you're spending often, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is. We'll go into that a little bit more in a <laughs> second, but you're right. I'm wondering, um, what sort of documents should you be looking at um, when you're trying to identify you know, the strength of your, of your finances and what you're taking to, to your accountant? Well, I mean, take, take into your accountant, I mean, well, bank statements is the first thing, but then obviously the payment summary. So basically what a payment summary does is the old grip certificate language. Uh, grip certificate language is basically saying, right, well, this is the money that your employer has paid you throughout the year, and this is the amount of tax that they've withheld for the, for the period of year. And that basically means that, they can, that the, tax, uh, the accountant can start his work from how much money you've earned. Obviously, if you're, if you're in business, you've got your own P&Ls, you've got zeros, MYOBs, you've got um, Reckon, you've got all these um, online softwares now that you can basically say, download what's called a CSV file now. A CSV file basically summarises your bank statements on an Excel document and you can basically just allocate your expenses to what is what's called a P&L and that basically shows you as far as your incomes and incoming and outgoings. Then that can be basically translated into where a tax return can be translated and the accountant can tell you where you're up to as far as your financial position. I think we've just been given a, an accountant's education. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking I reckon if I just had a few hundred bucks in my pocket each week and I knew I couldn't spend any more than that, then I'd be OK. But that's a well, very detailed answer. It's really a really good point, Charles. Answer, I mean, yeah. from a layman's point of view, you know, you've, you've been, you start on the ground yeah, now in yeah. agency and when you're going. So and how do you recommend to people who are coming to you and they're wanting to talk about getting into property and, and it's, creating it's, a portfolio? It is. What yeah. Stuart's saying is absolutely necessary, when you, especially when you are an investor and you're out there and you're in business and so on. I think most of the people that I know that are trying to buy their first property or investment property, you've just got to say to them, same as when I bought my first property, I was 18 years of age, I knew how much money I, I, I was getting a week and I took that portion that I could spend on myself and I never spent any more than that and the rest I saved and within a year I had a small deposit and I was able to buy a property and I think it's, it's, it's the reverse in the sense that if you, if you, you can spend, uh, live on a couple of grand a month, that's it, no more, put it into a separate account. And, and you look at that account every month. What's happening over here is what's running your life or running your business. Yeah, over here is what you can... And, and now there's so many apps where you can just check all the time. It's 
Split second, how much money you, you can got still left enjoy um, that avocado on toast, except you might not have it as often as, <laughs> as you'd like. I'm wondering how do you um, separate the difference between um, you know, a, a, an, an expense that's a need and an expense that is a want? Yeah, I suppose the needs kind of you know, your health is a good place to start. That, that's that's a need. Uh, making sure you're always you know keeping yourself healthy. A, a gym, you know, that can be a need. You know, the, the things that basically make sure you're always fit in your lifestyle to make sure you're always able to, to perform to your best is definitely a need. Um, you know, the groceries, uh, the school fees, the, the things that basically um, keep your household functioning, they're the needs. The wants. Well, you know, we, we all want to go on big holidays and we all want to have more lavish holidays and, and we want to have, you know, all the right gear as far as clothing and things like that. Those kind of things are your wants. So the, the, the things that you can, can do without. But at the same time, you want to be able to budget towards having them because they're the things that sometimes are more fun than others. You know, the, the restaurants, the social life, uh, as I said, the holidays, those kind of things are the, the things that give you the energy to bring the buzz back into the work life and, and to say, right, well, you can be more of an asset to you to where you work and therefore you can earn more. So, so th those kind of things, you know, as, as much as I don't like to you know, be really lavish on the, on the wants all the time, but they are the things that make us you know, have a better lifestyle and therefore more functional at work and then those kind of things earn more. So, but the, 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 the needs are definitely you know, the gyms, and the health, um, the, the groceries on the table and anything that basically runs and keeps the household running. Well, you, you don't look as fit as actually as Charles and I do, don't we you? No, know, it's a long way to go. Yeah, he's got a long way that's to go. Okay. I'm working we, on we, that. We, we, can, we can send you some notes on how. So I, I, see, I, I grew up in a very poor environment, you know, it's not like there are a lot of people who are brought up in wealthy environments and they're used to spending money and this is one of the biggest issues that you have in our society is that uh, access to money for younger people is a Take lot credit. easier. Mm. Is a lot easier. I mean, my environment, I would run to the gym, touch the front door, and run home because I couldn't afford to go in. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it is really interesting the way in which uh, people are brought up has a significant difference as to how they approach that kind of lifestyle and savings. I completely think, I mean, I remember the first time I went overseas, I couldn't get a credit card. Yeah. I was 24 yeah. and I had to get a debit card to take money to get overseas and yeah. yet credit is much more available. How does credit affect people when they're trying to get a portfolio? I mean, the amount of credit, as I'm understanding, and you're the accountant and expert, it's seen as debt, even though the next generation see it as, I've got all this money that I can spend. When they're trying to borrow and create a property portfolio, it's not the same scenario, well, is I mean, it? a credit card's kind of weird. I, I mean, it's a strange kind of concept. You, you kind of, you're right, you're going into more debt, therefore a credit card's basically put against your um, assets to save us how much debt you've got. But really, if you need a $5,000 credit card and you've got a $2,000 credit card, just put another $3,000 on it. Mm. That it's a five thousand dollar credit card, and but you're living within your means. Yes. So I'm, I'm not opposed to a credit cards. I think a credit card can be really functional things as far as if you're you know on the way home from work and there's a phone bill in your in your mailbox, you haven't seen it for two days, paying it right on the spot. You know, mm. making sure those things you're up to date with your expenses as, as far as a credit card can do that. But as I said to you, you don't need to make your, your credit card go from ten to fifteen thousand to twenty thousand. What you, what you really should be doing is saying, right, well, I can leave it where it is, but if I need more money for a certain activity, whether it be a, an expense you need to pay for put some more money on the credit card and then you can basically pay it off. Um, the, you know, the, or, or basically going on holidays and saying, right, I need, a, I need a credit card to go on holidays. It'd still be the same credit card at $4,000 for argument's sake, put another 5000 on it and all of a sudden it's a $9,000 credit card. A, a lot of people, because of the equity they've gained in the last few years in certain parts of Australia, have actually gone out and gotten more credit cards and more personal loans. Yep. And they don't, and, and many of them don't recognise the fact that they could just load that back into a housing loan and, and literally halve their interest rate. And, and so that's a big issue right now. That's a looming issue for our society, is all of those personal loans and credit cards that have been captured over the last few years of real estate growth. Well, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're doing a lot of, I mean, a lot of banks these days are being, doing higher pricing. So, for example, your interest rate can be 4%, but the banks will price it at eights and nines. And what you're saying there, Charles, is absolutely right. Like, you know, a credit card all of a sudden goes there as debt, your mortgage goes as debt, mm. your car finance goes as debt, mm. and all these things that you think, you know, I'll go to the bank, I'll work out you know, how, much, how, much, how much I can put aside for another mortgage, another, another property or a bigger property or whatever it may be, you kind of forget about the, the credit card, you forget about the, the, car, the car repayments and, and all these things actually do take in consideration to the banks and pricing at 9% or 8% as opposed to what your interest rate is 4%, you're kind of like doubling what your outgoings are even yeah. though you think they're half, half of the hour. Yeah, it's frightening. Access, um, yeah. yeah. Access has been pretty easy. It's changed now, but yeah. it's been pretty easy up until now. I think they're tightening a little bit, aren't they? Bit, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, when it's coming for people who are watching now and they're thinking, I want to try and get into, you know, create a port property portfolio and it's about finances, who should they be going to speak to to help strengthen their financial position, to, to give them sort of a, a master plan, if you like, or goals? 
Well, I mean, I, would, I mean, obviously the first choice is an accountant, okay. um, but I would have gone a bit further, a bit further. And that, an accountant can be an accountant, like, you know, your simple accountant down the road can do your tax return for you. But they're not really going to know um, as far as where best to, you know, advise as far as where, where your money should go and how to make your portfolio stronger and how and what's worked for people in the past. I mean, I, I, I've always wondered about people that give financial advice that don't really have any assets themselves. It's like it's a bit strange. You, the, the people that are wealthy around you and, and have um, used their money really smartly as far as making sure they've been able to, you know, grow their portfolio, leverage off it, but then, le you know, leverage in a, in a monitored way. Basically, you know, Charles, and people who are successful, people around you, they're, they're the people that are going to be, you know, you're best off talking to and finding out how they've done it because, you know, the, the errors of the past are, you know, are better if you know them rather than finding out yourself. And also the successes of the past, they're ways to you know, say, right, well, that's how you can get success as well. So people around you, like you know, your, you know, your, your advisors, your accountants, um, you know, people that have made money in the past, those kind of people are going to really, you know, people you trust, obviously, are going to be the people you... Charles made a great point before about the apps that are out these days. And, you know, there's so much technology. What do you think can be put in place and are there such apps that can help you sort of monitor your own, you know, wealth building that you're trying to, you know, build up this, this uh, deposit and trying to get into investment? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, apps, apps are great. Don't, yeah. don't, don't get me wrong, you know, I, I'm, I'm not that savvy on apps. I should, probably should be a bit more savvy on apps. But I, I, kind of, I kind of always, you know, log into what what's Charles is saying, you know, a different bank to what I live out of. So I, I live out of a, a separate bank. It's called St George, could have come off for argument's sake. But my, my mortgages are with a different bank. And I kind of always monitor that side of the fence, if you like, as far as those mortgage accounts, because I, can, I know what properties I've owned, owned as far as um, their values, and I know where my mortgages are. And I, I can always do a bit of a plus versus minus to find out where my asset base is. Mm -hmm. And over the other side over here with my bank that I live out of and have fun out of, it doesn't really matter. That, that's kind of money that doesn't exist, really. It's over the other side that basically you know, I want to make sure my wealth is always strong, and I can always log into it and find out where it's at. And then the apps that Charles is probably I do use, mate, is, is the ones you go into your bank and just log into your bank. They're, they're the apps that kind it's of... It's really you know, simple. It's yeah. really simple nowadays for people to balance the books and know how much they've got left to spend before the end of the month. So I think that's... A, for, for people starting out, that's the best thing for them. You, you know, you're down the path, you know where you're going with it. But people who are just starting out, they really need to just set a limit. Like going to auction. You know, you set a limit and don't go over that. You know what it is and, and don't get caught up in, uh, in the emotional side of it. And I think people can save just a little bit each time. Uh, they'll find themselves in a better position as the market comes back. And I think the market, people are talking about the market coming back mm. in 20 or 30 or what. My view is very simple on that. The boom, in my opinion, should have stopped two years ago, year and a half, two years ago. Whatever the price is where a year and a half or two years ago is where I think they'll come back to. Yep. Just the Reserve Bank reduced interest rates for the economic purposes and that sort of spurred the real estate market on. So I think when we get back to there, there's going to be a lot of people out there, if they're saving a little bit here and the prices are going backwards here, uh, they're going to have a much better chance in a year or two years' time. Well, that, 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 you know, that comes back to um, what I've been saying. I mean, as a tax accountant, we always say, you know, interest only on investment loans. But if you're always P&I, you're always making headway. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I kind of look at it and say, right, yeah, in interest only loans, they're great, but they don't really make headway on where I'm going. And even now, the banks are saying, you know, our portfolios as far as lending, we want to bring that interest only loan book down, down a lot further than it has been. Okay. So the banks are actually making headway as well. Now, everybody's saying right now, P&I, principal and interest loans, are the only way to go because you are making headway, as you're saying, Charles. Beautiful. Well, we're going to come back to you more with some of your wisdom of finances, but we're going to go now to see what is happening with the property market around Australia with Charles Tarby from Century 21 Australasia. And you've got the details. Thank you, James. Beautiful I do, segment. and I'll go through them quickly for Please you. Do. I'm watching your clock up there. <laughs> the auction clearance rates, so they're slightly down mm -hmm. uh, over this time last week. Uh, they, they came in at 58.4% this time last year. They were sitting up in the 60s, 68.7% where they were, but the Sydney market dropped below 60. Mm. So it came in at 55, there's a, a sorry, 56 uh, percent. And, uh, and I think that when I look at the number of auctions, 56.6%, I look at the number of auctions, there were 465 auctions. So it's really down. And Melbourne came in at 60.3 and their auction numbers were 803. So it's, it has changed, but it seems to be settling in the late 50s, early 60s at the moment. Canberra outdid everything again. Uh, Canberra and Adelaide have been the two that have been really championing the cause, 72.2% for Canberra. So better than this time last year, the only capital city. How about uh, homes advertised for sale? Yeah, there's more stock on the market. Uh, a slight increase of 0.08%. Uh, 
but more importantly, overall, 8.4 per cent higher than this time last year. Okay. You think that's because we're starting to get slowly getting towards some warmer weather? I think we are, and I also think that uh, a lot of people are now. Uh, realise that they might have missed the boat on selling and those that are going to sell and buy somewhere else they'll probably be able to do that now. Okay. Yeah. Um, the residential rent price movement. Yeah, that's negative. Uh, not it's, it's up this week, but negative over the week uh, overall, but better than this time last week. 0.46% down. Mm -hmm. Last week was 1.15% down. Best performing capital city, uh, Hobart's been performing very well for a long time, but the steadiest one is Melbourne at over 12% increase since this time three years ago. Adelaide's 24.29%. So Adelaide's starting to creep back a little bit, and I suspect it will creep back uh, significantly over the year to come. Yeah, we've seen that with the auctions on the, on the oh, weekend okay. show as well. Um, residential vacancy Yeah, they're, they're really good. Melbourne climbed only slightly, 0.84%. Fantastic uh, vacancy rate. Uh, the the one that Perth's jumped up again, 9.08%, mm -hmm. and Sydney's 2.6. Not too bad uh, over the three capital cities. I'd like to see Perth change downward a bit more, but 4.17% for those three capital cities combined. We're almost out of time. Yeah, we are Kick almost out of time. We're going to go for a quick break. <laughs> Thanks for joining us as always. You don't have to worry about any health in that mind of Charles Tarby from Century 21. We'll be back with you shortly after a break to talk some more about creating your financial portfolio and understanding what to do at tax time. You're watching Sky News Real Estate. Smart Investing.